everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Green Jeans. I am your one co-host, Annika Van Rossum, joined by my other co-host, Maya Van Rossum. And if you couldn't tell by our last names, we are in fact related. We are a mother-daughter duo, and what we talk about on this podcast is important social and environmental justice issues through a generational lens, because maybe a lot of the issues that my generation is facing, my mom's generation has been raising alarm bells about for decades. Um, Yeah, so that's our podcast. And always, you know, if you like what you're hearing, please uh, give us a rating on whatever platform you're listening to. And if you like what we do, look down at our episode description. Uh, We have ways that you can support uh, the two movements that we both work at and all that. But mom, it looks like you are yet again in another different location for this podcast episode. So where are you now? I am in Austin, Texas. Ooh, and what are you doing there? Well, every year there is the Texas Book Festival, which apparently is a really big deal. And they select a limited number of authors to come and be featured at the festival and to do panels and discussions and book signings. And so I've had the honor of being selected as one of the panelists at the Texas Book Festival. So the festival is this weekend. I actually speak on Sunday. I've been paired up with this uh, really well-known author, Douglas Brinkley, um, who has all kinds of accolades. Like I'm just looking at his thing. He was named the presidential historian for the New York Historical Society. He has... um, been given this award and that award and I I don't know I think he was nominated for a Grammy I mean this is like a guy with lots of writing accolades so it really is quite an honor to be um to be paired up with him on a panel and that's who I'm paired up with and I'm in apparently the C-SPAN tent so the whole our whole panel and everything in the C-SPAN tent gets televised, which is pretty cool. That's not for all the tents. There's just, I think, two tents. So I'm in one of those tents. Anyway, so that's where I'm at. It's pretty cool. That, that is super exciting and very jealous. And I can't wait. I'm sure we'll see all updates um, as things go forward. But that's exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. So, of course, by the time people hear this podcast, it will all have happened already. And I will either have tremendously succeeded or crashed and burned. (laughs) Everybody can hear about it, either witness it on TV or social media or hear about it at one of our upcoming podcasts. All right. Well, with that exciting update, and I'm sure you won't crash and burn. I don't know why you like to say these crazy things, but... Well, I want to know, though, actually, speaking of crashing and burning and weekend plans, I'm actually wondering, Annika, what are your weekend plans this upcoming weekend, which will have happened by the time the podcast airs? Oh, yeah. Well, this weekend, I will be spending my Saturday morning day at our lovely Delaware River Keeper Network annual member bike ride. Um, So it should be fun. We're going to be down at Bulls Island Recreation Area in New Jersey. And it's just a really great opportunity for our Delaware Riverkeeper members to get out and bike ride and, you know, hang out with the staff and really get that awesome time out in nature and also face to face with the people that we're working with to protect their communities. Yeah. And the thing is, for people to know is, yeah, well, this bike ride will have happened by the time you hear the podcast. It happens. That year, so you can be on the lookout out for it next year. But also, while the Delaware Riverkeeper Network is primarily an organization that does advocacy and litigation, we do like to get people out in and along the river and key tributary streams. So um, this is the bike ride event that happens every year, but there are other events that we do. There are canoe slash kayak trips. There are hikes. There are other ways in addition to activism that we like to engage people with nature. So you might've missed this one, but keep your eyes open for the next one because um, we do a number of them and they're all cool opportunities. Exactly. And with that, that's actually a perfect segue into our topic this week which has to do with bike riding um and we wanted to talk a little bit about actually how um 
I don't know. I guess it's kind of like a sciencey episode, kind of a personal experience episode um, with why it's better to bike in nature than out by roads. But also it's kind of unfortunate that we don't have the ability for people to be able to bike in their towns in a lot of places. Um, so I don't know. How do you want to kick this one off? Well, I was thinking about it. You know, when um, I, I, I live and now you live in and around the area where I grew up. And I remember when I was growing up, if I wanted to get something from the supermarket or like a treat, or if I wanted to go to a friend's house, my mother was very quick to say, go ride your bike there. And even if it was lots of hills and, you know, maybe it was a half hour bike ride, even as a young girl, I would go and, um, and do that. And my mother didn't think twice about encouraging me to do that. Um, She grew up in Holland where they do a lot of bike riding. But, you know, as you were growing up and Vim was growing up, it wouldn't occur to me now to tell you to go bike ride um, where we live. There, there aren't any bike paths that get you anywhere. You have to ride along the road, which is where I rode, you know, when I was young. But I think there are two issues that come to pop to my mind, Annika, and I don't know if they pop to your mind, but one is um, I worry about the safety issue, right? Like people are driving their cars, they're doing texting. And it's very easy to migrate off onto the shoulder because they're busy texting. Um, So I worry about safety from that perspective, but I actually worry a lot more uh, as well now than before about the level of pollution that's being spewed from vehicles. And um, yes, there are air quality mechanisms designed to reduce the pollution coming out of vehicles, but there's a lot of pollution that comes out of cars. And so I worry about um, your body and was worried about your body as a person riding your bike along these roadways and breathing in all of those all of those fumes. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I don't think I would ever bike anywhere around where we are. I mean, I think I already get nervous enough just being the driver of a car and seeing people out on their bikes. And I always feel really bad tailing behind them, waiting for the moment when I can curve all the way around them because I don't want to come anywhere close. Um, And, you know, people just doing it for exercise which I wish I could do, but I personally don't enjoy doing exercise where I'm constantly in fear that I might get hit by a car, um, especially in our area. But yeah, it was interesting. I actually was reading um, an article about from a PhD student who she wrote about how she does ride her bike every day to university. And she just made a quick list of, um, she calls it, her name is Rachel Schaefer and on environmental health news, she writes the toxic brew what am I breathing on my daily commute? And she writes, it includes particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, ozone, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. And she breaks down the issues with like each one of those. But I mean, that's like her daily commute. Yeah. And I think it's good because the thing is we want to encourage bike riding because it is good for the environment, right? We're using our own energy and power to get where we want to go. We're not using those fossil fuels. And of course, it's good for your health as well to to, um, do that exercise. Uh, But then this idea of pollution exposure, I think just adds a level of mindfulness that is necessary as we decide where to ride our bikes, when to ride our bikes, Um, You know, it's great to see in cities like Philadelphia and other cities where they're creating more and more opportunities for bikes and biking, but so often that those pathways are right along the road where the cars are. And, you know, I have to say, Annika, I, 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 I really am torn because I do believe in cycling to get where you're going. I do think that it's important um, but there is also this part of me that thinks about Oma, um, my mother, your grandmother, for those who are new to the podcast, you know, she rode her bike all the time when she, you know, was younger. Now, in her earliest years, she did it in Holland, where biking is is well laid out 
right? And you have bike paths and you can get anywhere. And that's a, just magnificent. But she came over to the United States when I was very young, moved here from, um, we were living in India. Um, and she rode her bike a lot along these roadways. And she ultimately got pancreatic cancer. And there was, that was a huge surprise. Pancreatic cancer was not a thing in our family. It was a real shock when Oma got pancreatic cancer. And around the time, you know, I was thinking about all the ways she was exposed to pollution when she was young and the war was happening around her in Holland, but also when she was older and riding her bike along roadways. And there is now research that actually links bike riding um, or air pollution. And then later there comes the bike riding connection, but air pollution with all kinds of cancers, lung cancer, of course, breast cancer and liver cancer, but also pancreatic cancer. And so that sort of weighs on me. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's hard to think about. I remember when I did study abroad in Amsterdam and I did it specifically because I chose Amsterdam specifically because of our family and I had never really spent a significant amount of chunk at one time in the Netherlands. And so I couldn't pass up the opportunity to be there for six months and really like connect with our history and see our family members and like think about Oma and all that. And whenever everybody asked me what, you know, what's the thing you miss most about study abroad? And my first response was biking everywhere. Like it's the, you know, not only is, I mean, granted, obviously Holland is, well, if you don't, if for people that don't know, Holland's easy to bike everywhere because it's super flat. Like you can, it's flat everywhere. So you can bike everywhere. But that aside, I mean, if you live in any city, like New York City doesn't have major hills, Philadelphia doesn't have major hills. Um, but you can't really bike safely. I mean, New York City's bike lanes, I've done it once or twice with friends and they're fine. They're not as nice, but I don't know if that's just because I also don't really like New York City, um, but they're better than Philadelphia. Um, but yeah, I never really thought about the cars until you and I started talking about it and the exhausts coming out of them. Um, and something that I found was interesting too in Scientific American, they wrote, Ironically, many cities that offer dedicated bike lanes often lay them out right next to busy bus lanes, unintentionally ensuring that drivers breathe in as much diesel exhaust as possible. So it's like, even when they're trying to create it to be more accessible, because also like, I don't think people realize creating a bikeable place makes it more accessible so that people who can't afford cars also, that's a whole other aspect, but also like, yeah, biking for your health. Um, or just because you don't want to contribute to climate change with car exhaust are now also putting their health at risk. Yeah, it's really, I think it's a very increasingly complicated issue because of all of these factors. It used to be easy. When when I was young, you know, you, you one, you needed to get somewhere, ride your bike um, because it got you there. But very much, one of the reasons why Oma said, ride your bike, was because she didn't want to burn the fossil fuel. She didn't want to burn the gasoline in the car. And she didn't want to burn the gasoline in the car because um, it was bad for the environment and it would be unnecessary in her mind. And also because it was expensive, right? Gas costs money. And so, and riding your bike, as you said, once you, once you have access to the bicycle, you can ride it over and over and over and it's free of charge. So, um, but then as we layer on top of it, this concern about, proximity to the pollution and what's happening to you. And you know the, I, the the reason why, in case people are wondering, why are we talking about this in the context of bike riding? Yes, air pollution, um, the, 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 the cancer causing concerns, the ADHD and the dementia and the Alzheimer's linked with air pollution, you know, all of the health harms and economic harms, uh, you know, associated with air pollution, that that is happening um, even if you're not bike riding. But the thing about bike riding is you're sucking in more air because you're exerting yourself. Right. So you're tremendous sucking in tremendously more air when you're bike riding than when you're just sitting around or walking. And then, too, this juxtaposition of people 
wanting to encourage bike riding because it's good for the environment, but then also understanding that there are these ramifications for your health. So what's the right answer and, and what's the right solution? And I think on net balance, um, the recommendations are yes, continue to ride your bike. It's good for your health. Like the, the net benefit is there, but understand that you, you are, depending on where you're riding your bike, you are having those, those impacts on, on, on your body and on your health. This is why we should have electric cars everywhere. <laughs> Um, I was reading, I'm just, um, I was reading this article in the New York Times from a couple of years ago, and it was talking about a New York City Health Department study uh, that came out and how, talking about how particulates in the air cause more than 2,000 premature deaths in a year and 6,000 emergency room visits and hospitalizations each year. This is actually an issue that I also explore in my book. And I do talk about OMA and the ramifications for OMA. And just in this article, it, it, it specifically says, and while the city has rapidly expanded its bike lanes and other bike-friendly infrastructure during the past decade, most of the planning to date has focused on traffic safety concerns not pollution. And I think that's part of the problem is we have these cities that are trying to encourage biking because it is more accessible and there are all of these benefits and it is in demand. People want it, but they're trying to plop the biking onto this already existing um, travel route corridor. And they're not sort of rethinking the whole system and saying, how can we actually make real place and space for the cyclists and the bikers that is mindful of traffic issues and mindful of health issues. And, you know, rethink the whole thing rather than just say, okay, well, we have a city that's designed to accommodate cars. All right, now we got to somehow weave bikes into that. And that's how we end up with a little bit of this, this problem. Yeah. I mean, I definitely too, I think it's always tough for me, I think, with my not chronic asthma, but um, for for those who don't know, I don't have chronic asthma, but I have asthma that usually gets induced by, um, I have like an allergic reaction to things sometimes and when I get sick, it's been really bad. COVID has definitely, since our family got sick with COVID long ago, it definitely has worsened it. Um, and it is those things that always, like, if I ever lived in a city, I don't even know if I would be able to, at this point, like, take advantage of biking, because I always worry about it um, affecting that and making that even worse down the line and knowing things that happen to our family like it is. Like, I don't want to risk that even more than, like, any genetic predispositions or anything. But, yeah, I mean, and I don't know. I, you know, it's one of the things we talk about on this podcast, like sometimes we have great solutions, sometimes we don't, I don't even know how one would rework the city, but I imagine like a great start would be to separate the bike lane and the car traffic with like trees or shrubbery in between, because in at least the way it was in Holland, if I'm remembering it correctly, it wasn't even like how there was the painted bike lane and then you're next to the cars, there's like a curb, it's the bike, it's the sidewalk the bike lane and then there's a curb so that you wouldn't be like a car couldn't just veer in without hitting this curb yeah i mean it's a it's an entirely different system and the you know looking at the research they do say that um there is scientific results to show that when bike lanes are separated from active traffic just by like a, a width that's they, they talked about like a row of parked cars um, between the cyclists and, and the cars that the bicyclists actually are breathing in a lot less pollution than when they're biking in bike lanes that are running in traffic. And so that is one of the differences in, in Holland, as you said, one, the lane is, the bike lane is next to, but apart from the traffic. And it is not uncommon that you would have vegetation and other things between that can help filter out and buffer what's happening. So you don't have the same level of exposure. And I agree with you. Look, you know, yes, it takes a, an additional level of mindfulness to think, well, how are we going to integrate 
bike lanes in a way that that um, also think about this pollution exposure. But I know there are ways to do it. And if people would take the time to think about it, they could figure it out but they're not taking the time to think about it. And that's part of the problem. And that's part of the problem. And so much of what we have with the environment, you know, it's like, let, 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 let's just do these cookie cutter solutions or let's like put our thumb in the dike, but not let's not let, really think more holistically about what is the problem that we're struggling with? What is the solution? And what are the ancillary issues right here with biking? Part of it is they're they're creating bike lanes because people want to ride their bikes, right? And they want to do that for economic reasons, um, and they want to do it for health reasons, and they want to do it for environmental reasons. So yes, that is, those are the 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 goals that we're trying to achieve. But we have to think about what are the other layers as we're looking to achieve. Them. And here it's um, pollution exposure. Um, yeah, and when I was looking up, just because I was thinking about how like the safety concerns, so I just wanted to see if I could find any bicyclist, stat, bicyclist accident stats, and I thought it was interesting, this one on um, Share the Road, the Cycling Coalition, which is cool. Um, the one stat says, U.S. cyclists are three times more likely to be killed than German cyclists, and six times more likely than Dutch cyclists whether compared per trip or per distance traveled. Wow. And a lot of that probably is how um, bicycling is integrated into society. And part of that I think is physically, right? Like, you know, in terms of having separate bike lanes and all, but in the United States, car drivers are not very mindful of bicyclists. And not only are they not mindful, but they they can also be very antagonistic. I mean, I remember growing up and I have experienced it um, in recent times that I'll be riding my bike on a road and no, there's no bike lane and maybe bike lane and maybe there's not a big shoulder, um, you know? And so, yes, it can impact cars, but you know, I'm entitled to be on the road and the cars will come right up next to me and then honk their horn in my ear, right? Like to frighten you. Um, or they drive very, very close. And rather than wait, as you said, for a time to be able to go out a little bit and give you some safety space, they go right up next to you as, as though to say, this is my road because I'm a car. You're not allowed to be here because you're a bike. You know, they really, or I, I've, I've had um, experiences where somebody actually reach, reached out of their car window, like to reach at me. Okay. You know, I mean, there are really frightening things that happen. And it's because it's, it's in no small part, because here in the United States of America, if you're driving a car, you think the road belongs to you. You don't think bicyclists are entitled to be on the road. You don't think pedestrians are entitled to be on the road. And you know what? Bicyclists and pedestrians are entitled to be on that road. The road doesn't belong to the car drivers and the yeah. car drivers have to share the road and have to be respectful. So, you know, we have, you know, we were talking about this whole issue of, of pollution. But there is also a whole issue of respect and share the road. So that's part of what, you know, plays into my decision as a parent about whether or not I wanted to encourage my kids to ride on the local roads around where we live because there is no bike path. And I know that that's how car drivers behave. And then you layer on top of it the fact that you have a lot of texting and phone calls and distractions. Um, and, you know, where people do migrate into that shoulder. Um, so that becomes an added layer of safety. And now you layer onto it the fact that you now have these pollution exposures and traffic levels are up, at least where we live. So now that pollution exposure, along with that safety exposure, is um, higher and higher. And I mean, when I say safety exposure, of course, I mean accident, you know, unsafe conditions is higher and higher. And so when you wrap it all up, I, you know, I really find myself struggling about what's the right answer, at least in an area where we live. If there's a bike lane, like you're, you know, where you were cycling on Bulls Island, along Bulls Island, right? There's that, that, that the canal path in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, um, beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. canal path in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, 
and on the opposite side of the river in, in New Jersey. And great commuter route. And there are a lot of great commuter routes that are popping up, but there aren't enough of them. Yeah. And um, I wish there were more because bike riding is a beautiful thing and it is a great way to get around. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's something I wish I could do. Like even hills aside, it's like I just can't do it because of safety reasons. But yeah. Well, you know what, one other, just before we go on to some of our solutions, one other factoid, because we've talked about how when you ride a bike, you take in um, more air. I did find, um, I'm sure there are a lot of, I found one comparison, and it just talks about um, that when somebody is in a resting state, they might take in on the order of eight liters of air per minute. But when bicycling, the volume goes up to 70 liters per minute. So if those liters of air have particle pollution or other kinds of pollution in them, right, you can imagine how you're really upping the ante. And I do, you know, I do think about, again, we're talking about bike riding, but, you know, there are a lot of studies that are um, now researching the exposure of kids in urban areas to air pollution because, uh, you know, and putting on their in on their school backpacks, like air monitors, because of the very fact that when kids are walking to school or walking around in, in, in city communities or urban communities, the younger kids, very literally, their faces, like where they're breathing in, is at the same level as the tailpipe from trucks, buses, yeah. And cars, and just it's like you're like shooting pollution right into their faces. So that's lovely, disturbing. disturbing. Yeah, and well, it seems to be if they were on a bike, for that matter, if you think about it, because they're on lower bikes. Yeah. So do you want to hop to some solutions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be great. Okay, so you know, I I don't want to come across as to people as though we're dissing bike riding. We are not. We are not. We enjoy it. We love it. We believe in it. And and as we said in the conversation, on balance, um, the researchers do very much say, while you do have increased pollution, pollution exposure, the net health benefits of riding your bike are higher. So keep riding for your health, but try to be mindful of where you're riding and when you're riding, because you can, through different kinds of choices, um, impact the level of exposure. So for example, one of the options is when you're planning your route for where you're gonna go, try to go on roads that are less busy, right? Less cars, less pollution, less, less busy. Um, that's one of the solutions to consider. If you, if you can think about time, if you have the luxury right now, if you're trying to get to work, you might have to get to work at a certain time. But if you have the luxury, um, there are different times of the day when traffic is different. For example, it's suggested that between 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., traffic is a lot lighter on roadways. So if you're doing a morning commute to work, can you go earlier? So you have less pollution exposure. Um, the, if you can, avoid riding in times when there's high heat, because uh, according to this Associated Press article, um, of course, heat is very stressful on the body, and it makes you work harder and breathe harder. Uh, and so when you're breathing harder, right, you're taking in more of that pollution. You're, you're breathing more deeply so that air pollution is going more deeply into your lungs where it can have its um, impacts. And then um, one of the recommendations that, again, comes from an Associated Press article really is, well, they say don't overdo it. They say bicycling less than 90 minutes or two hours is probably a benefit for your health rather than taking a car. But 90 minutes or two hours is the cutoff. That's when the benefits of exercise and the harm of air pollution begin to trade off. And again, that's an Associated Press article by a Richard Vogel. Um, so I thought that those were really good advice points to, for people to think about. Um, 
you know, to help ameliorate some of these pollution concerns. Yeah, no, I agree. I think so. And I think, I mean, this is me, this is coming out of Annika's brain. This is not <laughs> coming out of any article, but I'm sure too, if you live in a town that you think you would like to bike, but you don't feel is safe or accessible, you know, I don't see why one couldn't write a letter to their township or start a community organizing group or something and, you know, advocate for yourselves, for your town to get a bike lane, whatever that means, and, you know, be really a part of that process. And I think, you know, it would, I think those are things that unfortunately, like we won't see happening until citizens start asking for it, until people start asking for it. So I would encourage anybody, it's like, yeah, I really want that, you know, get your, get whoever you want together, sign a petition, start a movement, and encourage your town, city official, whatever, to get building a bike lane. And that's such a great idea. Uh, you know, it, it, it often does come from the grassroots. And these days, more and more, there actually are funding opportunities at the state level and at the federal level for communities who want to build bike lanes. Um, so, you know, if you can if you can get a movement going in your town, you can maybe be able to get your town to get some dollars to help invest in walking trails and bike lanes that are available to the whole community. You know, and if you've got a couple of communities side by side that are developing these bike lanes, often they will develop these bike lanes in a way that pairs them up. And so what maybe was a bike lane that just went through your town now becomes a bike lane that goes through a whole bunch of neighboring towns and ultimately can get you into the nearby city or wherever, you know, to the to the shopping center. So that really is great advice, Annika, because it can make a lot of difference if you can get the grassroots in your community behind advancing a bike lane. Yeah, so I think with that, we've covered our, our bike topic for the week. Um, but yeah, so if you, and again, if you enjoy what we do here, well, number one, reminder to go to the description link below and order yourself a copy of the second edition of the Green Amendment. Gift giving season is coming up. So you might want to get that for your favorite tree hugger in your family or somebody that you're trying to convince to become a tree hugger, um, number one. And then if you, yeah, reminder that if you are ever interested in getting in the outdoors and doing a bike ride or, you know, just live in the Delaware River watershed, um, feel free to become, go to one of the links and become a member and or donate to the Delaware River Keeper Network. And of course, you can also always join and support Green Amendments for the Generations, the national movement that's about getting constitutional environmental rights to protect present and future generations, and really to address, you know, all of the environmental issues that we talk about, including air pollution, making sure that people have a constitutional right to clean air, so that when our government officials behave in a way that allows industry to overwhelm us with pollution that devastates our health and our lives, that we the people can actually turn to the constitution to try to get a remedy. So Green Amendments for the Generations is, is a national movement, but it's also an organization. And, um, and a lot of the work we do is in the boundaries of the Delaware River watershed in the watershed states, but a lot of the work that we do is in states across the nation. So wherever you live, there's an opportunity for you to get involved. So with that, we'll see you all next time. See you next time.